Well, good evening once again. Thank you for joining me this evening. Uh, we are continuing with our uh, study based on Diana Butler Bass's book, Freeing Jesus, uh, and, and kind of working through the, the half dozen or so, um, what do we call them, categories, titles, labels that she wants to explore. And again, um, these are common ways that we all think about Jesus. Uh, but the point is, is to use these uh, sort of common ideas and, and standard titles and, and rather use them as ways to sort of narrowly entrap Jesus into very particular sort of doctrinal or dogmatic kind of places. How do we set Jesus free so that so that there's space for us to have a relationship with him, for so that there's room for us uh, to really freely understand uh, and experience the wholeness of Jesus. And so today, uh, a pretty obvious one, Jesus is the way. Uh, and of course, it really flows from this verse in John 14, during Jesus's final discourse with his disciples, I am the way, he says, the truth and the life. One of a couple of dozen of uh, the famous I am statements of Jesus uh, in the Bible. Uh, and, and, you know, again, and like all of these conversations, it seems simple enough, uh, a lovely kind of idea. Jesus is the way, and, and when we get lost, uh, when we're not sure where we're going or how to find ourselves, uh, he is the way there, or the way out of problems. Right? Jesus will lead us through our troubles. Uh, there's very similarities here to the idea of Jesus as the good shepherd, another uh, statement that he uses as well. But it, it's, here's where it gets tricky, and, and this is where we need to start. It, is it a way forward or do we, when we think of Jesus as a way, do we think of Jesus as the way to something or the way into something? I mean, he says also in John, I am the gate. And I think that kind of imagery often uh, sort of, uh, of, of captures us when we think about this. And, and uh, uh, in the book, it, she talks often about that notion that, that Jesus became a way into something and, and that something became a cage, right? It became a constriction. Jesus is the narrow gate and the only way. And rather than seeing this as a, a, a way to sort of freely journey through life with faith, um, it becomes this sort of trap uh, that we get kind of caught up into. And really the, the word I want to talk a little bit here about is this word, uh, church word, orthodoxy, which is also a word that means way. Uh, in fact, it means quite specifically the right way. And it is a word that we use in church and among pastors to describe uh, good doctrine, good dogma. This is the right way to think. This is the right way to believe. There's a right way and a wrong way. And what is orthodox uh, is what is right, correct? And, and that becomes kind of then uh, this thing then that, that, that keeps us from being free. It really kind of starts uh, in the year 325. So three centuries after Jesus' death, uh, in the Roman Empire, as it has already now reached its peak down and starting its just decline, um, the emperor is Constantine, who is facing a kind of a fractured empire now. And there's lots of, of forces at play, and it's getting more and more difficult to kind of hold all the pieces together. And so Constantine is looking for a way to unite the empire. Uh, and, and of course, he's a constant war with different factions and different groups. And uh, during one uh, rather famous battle, uh, he uses the Christian symbol on his flag. And uh, I think what Constantine has discovered that it, it, to, to unite the empire, he needs something to unite them under. And he has discovered Christianity, he has discovered this Christian community, which has become not insignificant in his time, even though it is based off and on different persecutions and frankly is still not fully recognized or legal in the empire. But Constantine knows that because of that, it's also a group that he can control because the Christians have no power, he can use them uh, and, and they will follow him uh, as he gives them power. So anyway, Constantine converts to Christianity. And in the year 325, he gathers all of the Christian leaders together in a town called Nicaea. Uh, and he sits them down and he says, now, write out your teachings. Describe what it means to believe. In the first four centuries of the Christian community, the question 
frankly, the most significant question that they all wrestled with is, is what is the nature of Jesus and how is Jesus God and how does that come together? And so out of Nicaea comes the Nicene Creed, which is very focused on what is the nature of Jesus. And Constantine's influence on that creed is pretty unmistakable that there are Greek philosophical concepts that really underlie the language in the Nicene Creed and, and how we all come to understand that Jesus is the substance of the Father, right? Uh, of one substance with the Father, um, of uh, not being made. And all of that language very much comes out of, of Constantine bringing now uh, the, imper the uh, imperial forces now into the church. Uh, and so Christianity now becomes the religion of the empire, but more importantly now, Christianity has a doctrine. It has a dogma. Now it has creedal statements. Now there is a right way to believe, believe and a right way to live. And because Christianity has power and status, it has the capacity now to enforce orthodoxy, uh, to, to bring itself, to bring all of, the, all of the community of faith into one gathering, one church, one way of thinking, one way of believing, one language, one way of worship even. And all of that now is coming to be. Uh, and as Christianity now becomes the empire of the the religion of the empire, and the empire becomes the heart and soul uh, of the Christian church. And so we get this notion of orthodoxy and this notion of enforced belief, and that's how it has to be, right? And so once we start getting on this path, now uh, faith, now the life of the church is really defined by authority. No doubt also because there's money at stake right, and power and status. But, but at, at a more simple level, the notion of doctrine uh, is who draws the map? Who decides what is the way of the church? Who decides how we're going to believe and how we're going to practice? And, and so the accumulation of authority, the ability uh, to determine that, to say that, uh, to hold that against others, really becomes defining in the church and continues to really be defining in the church today. Uh, she uh, reminds me uh, in her writing, she, she mentions a joke that we often, uh, that I knew too. Uh, for those of us who go to a seminary, the joke is we don't call them seminaries, we call them cemeteries, because they are a place where uh, free thinking goes to die, right? The, the, the point of seminary training and education is that you should learn what is orthodox, what is right, and, and then being a good pastor, you can teach your congregants, you can teach your community how to also believe what is right and what is the right way and, and save people from the wrong beliefs. And you understand that orthodox is very, orthodoxy is very much about this battle, this fight uh, over who gets to say and, and what gets to happen and what doesn't. And, and you can see it. I mean, you, I know that you can see it in the church right now. Uh, you know, the constant battles over who believes what and whose belief is right. And, and, and of course, what really sort of drives this, again, is this notion of Jesus being the way, but it's the words that come right after that, the last half of that verse. I am the way and the truth and the life. And then the words, no one comes to the Father except through me, right? The clobber verse of the Bible that we then use uh, to attack everybody uh, who is not like us, right? Muslims and Jews and people who don't believe in Jesus for sure. But then when we get tired of attacking them, then we just start going after each other. You know, those other Lutherans and Catholics and, and all of those other people who don't believe right. And, and, and the soul of the church gets very much caught up in this fight to define what Jesus meant when he said he is the way. And, and, and to, to put that in some uh, both concrete and static terms uh, and, and to win the battle, right? And to win the battle over that. Um, and, and so, of course, what happens is, is then that theology becomes very constricted, very tight as is this straight jacket that we have to wear, that we have to believe. And, of course, the more constricted our faith becomes, uh, the more constricted we become. Right? We end up becoming prisoners of the church, forced to believe things, not allowed to have questions, not allowed to wonder. Uh, imagination is the enemy uh, of faith because what's most important uh, about faith is that we are certain. We know what we believe. We have been told that's right. This is certainly true, 
That's a great line, right, from Luther's Catechism. This is most certainly true. That's how we were all raised in the faith. It has to be this way. And, and there's no room for any other way in the community of faith. And, and then that becomes our, uh, that becomes our, what has a hold on us, right? That, that becomes then the trap in which we live. Those are the handcuffs uh, with which we must go through the rest of our life. There's like no, no room for that. And, and at one level, of course, we like that. Uh, the world is a mess messy place. Life is messy. We want some certainty. Nobody wants to have to live with doubt. On the other hand, doubt really, if certainty really is the enemy of faith. We, we think doubt is the enemy of faith. Doubt is what keeps us from believing. I, I think what we discover, what turns out to be true as we go on through life, uh, is, is that those things that we always thought were certain, they keep us from believing. They, they force us just simply to accept. They put us in this place of authority or lack of authority, and, and, and we don't live by faith. We just live by doctrine, and that's no way to live at all. The opposite of doubt, the faith isn't doubt. It's certainty, right? It's this notion that you have to believe this way. And the way, reason that I know that this is true is that certainty is how we use, to, is what we use to keep people out of church. Certainty is what we use to keep questions from being asked. Certainty is the tool and the weapon we use against one another. And as much as that is the case, it cannot possibly be faith. Right? Faith is supposed to draw us nearer to God, whereas doctrine becomes this barrier that keeps us from Jesus. Right? Faith is about knowing about Jesus, but not about having a relationship with Jesus. And it doesn't work like that. It's not good or right for us. And so um, instead, then, we need to get rid of this notion of certainty. We need to discover what it means to talk about Jesus as the way with leaving room for as the way of leaving room, with leaving room for faith. This is how we do that always, right? We talk about context. What is the context in which Jesus says these words, I am the truth, the way, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Right? It, it happens during his last course, his last meal with the disciples, right? As he's preparing now to go to Gethsemane and he knows that that when dawn comes, it will be Good Friday and all that that means. And, and his disciples can detect that something is going on in him, even if they're not perfectly clear on what he's up to yet. They know that there's a problem, and he has told, and told them that he is leaving them now. A little while, and I'll be with you no longer, he has said. And it sparks this long conversation. And it becomes pretty obvious that they are terribly afraid. Where are you going, Thomas asks, and how can we follow you if we don't know the way? And that's what sparks that response. Well, I am the way. These words are a response to their fear. These words are not meant to make them even more afraid. No one comes to the Father except through me. So if you don't get the answers to the quiz right, you're doomed. It's meant to, to say to them, there is a way to help you when you are lost. I have come to provide you a way when you are struggling, when you are lost, when you are afraid. There will always be access to grace through me. And, 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 and the fact that we always want to interpret it as a negative is, of course, on us. right? The fact that it's meant to be a word of comfort and hope should help us to hear that word kind of differently. right? If, if Jesus was not with them, they would certainly be lost. If Jesus was not with us, we would certainly be lost. Except that God dared to show us his grace in Jesus, we should not know anything about ourselves or our world or our salvation. And so those words are meant to, to give hope to us uh, and not simply meant to be a, uh, a weapon that we can use against one another. It is helpful to know that, that the whole of the Bible is filled with wanderers, and questioners, and pilgrims, and people moving about. I think it's important to know that Jesus was a wanderer. He was an itinerant preacher. He didn't come and build structures and institutions, right? He came and traveled among the people. He was constantly on the move, constantly on the go. And, and of course, I, I think that we, we lose 
a lot of our faith life when we don't really pay attention to this word. Right? What, what is a pilgrim except the person who doesn't have a home? Right? Uh, a pilgrim is a person who must wander constantly in search of something. And, and, and that's a great defining word for, for us as people of faith. Uh, we are pilgrims. We are constantly on the move, constantly seeking out the way that Jesus has showed us, constantly going after, looking for the kingdom of God. I, I like to use this word for Jesus in this kind of way. Right? Jesus is God, but he lives, he leaves heaven to become a pilgrim, to walk among us as a pilgrim, as somebody who doesn't really belong here, yet he takes on our form and becomes a pilgrim and walks among us and invites us then to be a pilgrim in our own life, in our own world, to walk among others, uh, not to just stay in our comfortable little places, right, but to go in, into strange places, even as he did. Uh, it is also important to know that prior to Constantine, prior to Nicaea, um, the Christian community believes a lot of different things. There are lots of different strands of early Christianity. There are lots of different ideas. Every community has its own uh, sort of, of slant to it. Uh, that's part of the joy of the early church, uh, that it didn't have just one way of being. And yes, there was a lot of back and forth and a lot of conversations about what one group believed or what others believed and how to sort that out. And there were efforts, obviously, to be able to say, you know, that is definitely not the way. But, outside, but within those kind of broad boundaries, there was a lot of room in the early church for a lot of different believers, a lot of different people who brought a lot of different things to the table. That was the whole joy of the church that we have very much lost in our age. Because we have very much become a church that is mostly just interested in people who are just like us. And I think when you walk into American churches these days, you can really see that. I mean, I don't think you even have to know a whole lot about the community. You can walk into the building and discover that it's pretty much a gathering of people who are just pretty much like each other. And, and that's how it happens. I mean, that's our great battles to recover uh, that diversity of life and thought. Uh, that, that really lends some joy uh, to the Christian faith. Uh, instead of making it this drudgery and, again, this constant battle of uh, one against the other. Um, so what does it mean for us to talk about Jesus as a way when we talk about faith? I, I think a couple of things, and, and she points several of these out. One is, is to remember that the way may be multiple paths. There are many different ways to walk with Jesus. There are many different roads to travel in faith. Uh, she suggests, and I think that she's right to say, that these are pretty much parallel roads, right? That, that it's not that you can just go any old way you want to go. But that by no means suggests that, that there can only be one path to travel, right? That we are all unique individuals in God's creation. We all live unique lives. That's part of the beauty of, of the creation is its diversity, which means that that's part of the beauty of the journey of faith is that we all take different ways to get to the place that we are going. There are things that tie and bind us together, to be sure. Right? There, there are truths uh, that we measure ourselves against that help us all go and travel and work in the same direction. That, that does not by any means suggest that there can only be one path. I think it's also true, as, and as she says, that sometimes the path, the way of Jesus is a way of joy, uh, a, a way of peace and love and light. Sometimes the way of joy is a darker way, a more difficult way, a way of struggle, right? A way of, of sacrifice, a way of, of coming through hard places. That that can also be part of what it means to follow the way of Jesus. Sometimes following Jesus leads us through difficult things. Sometimes it is the way of Jesus that gets us through difficult things. Sometimes that's actually what makes it just kind of awesome and wonderful. Uh, I, I think that, that we can't really talk about the way of faith without talking about risk. That, that following Jesus, that the way of Jesus uh, is a dangerous way at times. It asks us to come out of our comfort zone. I, I think that's probably what's particularly valuable uh, about this language of the way of journey 
is that it's not about standing still. It's not about hunkering down. It, it's one of those unfortunate sort of Lutheran things uh, that, that uh, our great hymn is a mighty fortress uh, is our God, that we think faith is this wall that we put up against the world. Whereas I think the truth is, is that as we read the Gospels, Jesus is constantly going outside of the walls. Uh, to do his ministry outside of the walls and calling us outside of, of, of our sort of safe forts uh, to go out into the places of the world, the difficult places of the world, uh, the highways and the byways to borrow the language of that particular parable uh, and, and to find those whom we are, are, are called to serve. Uh, I think the way is complicated because after all, life is complicated. And, and, you know, it is the complexity of life, of course, that tends to, to throw us off. That's part of, of course, what we're running away from when we hear this language. And I want to talk about a journey of faith. I want to talk about getting in a place of safety. I want faith to be my protection. Um, but the truth is, is that life is complicated. And as we go out into life, if we dare to open our eyes and really see the world as it is and discover the complexities of life, Faith has to match that, right? We need to have a faith that can keep up with the complexities of life, a faith that can kind of match that. That has to be part of the way that we travel uh, kind of as well again. Of course, what's really amazing and kind of cool about this is that it's those complications that help us grow in faith because it's those complications that challenge us, that, that force us to ask one of the most difficult question is in life, which is what if I'm wrong? But it's of course in that question that we learn and that we grow, right? And, and then we come to better things as well. So, so engaging in complicated, in the complications of life, engaging in, in discovering different ideas, people who believe and live out their faith differently is the best thing for us as we seek to find the way that is Jesus. Because it gives us it gives us a place to have that conversation. It gives us that place to measure what it is that we do think and teach and believe. And, and to, to say, okay, is this the way that we should be on? And to ask Jesus, is this the way that you're leading me? And maybe to discover that the way that we're on is not getting us where we want to go, not the way we should be traveling. And, and in that process, those complications actually become the real tools of faith uh, and not the enemies of faith as well. There are two other things that she says in, in uh, this particular chapter of the book uh, one that I liked, one that I disagreed with, and one that I did not. Uh, this is the one that I disagree with. She says, you cannot go on a journey if you are destined to fail and the course is predetermined. Uh, this language here uh, is, is where she wants to talk about the idea of sin, right? And, and um, she's uh, sort of trained as a Calvinist or trained among a lot of Calvinists of this very hardcore understanding of sin. Uh, as Lutherans, we have a, a, a pretty strong theology of sin and understanding that we are totally lost and cannot save ourselves. That's kind of key and, and important uh, to, uh, to our faith. To, that, that, that's our grounding, right? That's sort of our starting point. What, what I want to say to this is, her point is obviously is, if, is you, you can't make the way if you're constantly down on yourself. If you only believe that you can fail, then, then how do you go forward? I don't think that's what sin is about. Sin is this discovery that, of course, we are destined to fail. But God still loves us anyway and uses us as his instruments and brings us on this journey and is present to us. And that's what makes the journey amazing. It's not that God leads us because we are smart enough or wise enough or strong enough or good enough to find the way. It's the fact that he leads us because we need him to lead us, to show us the way. It is our inability to, to make the journey by ourselves that makes the journey worth taking. Because it's not a journey we take alone, right? It's a journey that God takes us on that we call life. Uh, and then, of course, this notion that the course is predetermined. Um, and, and again, you know, coming, having uh, her having uh, trained among these Calvinists, these strict, uh, what they call double predestination, that God has chosen some to be saved and chosen some not to be saved. Uh, not something we believe as Lutherans either, right? But there has to be a point where we understand that the journey has a destination. And that destination has already been set for us. 
it, it may seem like we're kind of wandering all over the place as we make our way on this journey, as we, as, as we try to find the way of Jesus. Uh, and, and that way may take many shapes and many twists and turns. Uh, but in the end, that way is leading us to one place, right? To one end, to one kingdom, uh, to one life, to one God, to one grace. And, and in that sense, uh, whether it's predetermined or not is sort of beside the point. What's important about the journey is that it is going somewhere. And, and what we want to hear in that is, we already know how the journey ends. That gives us the, the peace and the grace to enjoy the journey as we travel it. If the only reason we were taking the journey was to get to its end, we would be rushing through it so quickly we would never notice anything along the way. Knowing that the end is already set gives us a space to do something with the time we have now, to do something with the journey itself, to notice those who travel with us, to make the most of every step that we take every single day. Having, having the end set does not take the fun out of the journey. It's what actually makes the journey fun and I think worth taking. One other thing, I liked this a lot. Jesus is no interstate to glory. The way is made by walking. It, when we talk about Jesus as the way, the I think the sort of subtext that we often get into is is it gonna get if I go on the right way, just gonna bypass all the troubles in life. It's gonna be a smooth and easy journey. Uh, some will even say just a prosperous and wonderful journey, and at the end will be this great light, heaven, all of this reward language uh, that has become so much a part of the American gospel. Um, that's not what Jesus means when he means he is the way. He says those words as he is about to walk, in fact, a very difficult journey, as he is about to take those last horrendous steps to Calvary and to his cross. He is not promising us anything easy here, and, and it's not about triumph at the end of the journey. It is, in fact, about the steps that we take, the hard difficult but grace-filled steps that we take on the journey every day. And the only way, the only, uh, the only way to find the way is to walk the way. We only will know what faith is when we walk it. Thank you for uh, being with me tonight. I'm just, uh, again, uh, trying to keep an eye on the Facebook page. If there are comments, if you have thoughts or questions, leave them for me. Uh, I try to keep an eye on it through the week and hopefully uh, notice anything that you have, get a notification of it if you do. As always, if you have thoughts or comments, I'd love to talk with you about them some more. Uh, next week, we'll do the last uh, of her pieces, and then I have a couple of thoughts of my own uh, of ways to talk and think uh, about Jesus that will help us all sort of set him free uh, so that we can all grow in deeper relationships with him. Uh, until then, uh, have a great day. Have a great week. Uh, hopefully we'll see you Sunday morning uh, for 8.30 worship.